pleased to have this opportunity to speak about one of my favorite topics, acute atrial fibrillation. Thank you so much for joining in today, wherever you might be. I have two disclosures. I have an unrestricted research grant from Incarta Therapeutics for less than $20,000. And I have an unrestricted in-kind contribution of medication vernaclant for an upcoming clinical trial from Cypher Pharmaceuticals. So this is what I plan to cover over the next half hour or so. What exactly do I mean by acute onset atrial fibrillation? We'll look at an interesting uh, case. What's new in the literature? What do the Cardiology Society guidelines tell us? And then finally, we're going to zero in on rational management of acute atrial fibrillation in the emergency department, addressing issues like should you cardiovert? Is it safe? How do you achieve good rate control? What are the options for rhythm control? How do you prevent a stroke? And can your patient go home after you finish treating them? So when I talk about acute onset atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter, we're talking about symptomatic acute onset episodes of AF or a flutter where cardioversion is an option, which generally means the onset was less than 48 hours. Could be less than seven days if the patient's fully anticoagulated. Could be the first episode or it could be a recurrent episode that we call paroxysmal. It's definitely not permanent or chronic AF. You work in the emergency department and we know that these patients with acute onset, they come to the emergency department directly from home. They've had a sudden onset of rapid heartbeat and palpitations and where they go is the emergency department. They don't go to their family doctor. They don't go try to get an appointment with the cardiologist. They come to the emergency department. So it's really totally in our domain to uh, look after them. Now, uh, Canadian guidelines uh, uh, prefer immediate cardioversion and discharge home from the ED. So I guess my, uh, my goal is to try to convince you that this is the best way to manage patients uh, with acute AF. So let's look at a study. Uh, and uh, I'm going to ask, give you four choices on how best to manage this patient. So here we have a 67-year-old man with a sudden onset of palpitations six hours prior. He feels slightly weak, but he has no chest pain or shortness of breath. He has no history of arrhythmia or cardiac disease. He's generally well, but takes a statin. Heart rate is 150, BP 140 over 90, uh, oxygen saturation 95%, temperature 37.1. He looks well. He's not in any distress. So. There's multiple options in how one might manage it. So I want you to ask yourself, where you work now in your ED, what, what would you likely do? Would you control the rate and then send the patient home on oral anticoagulants? Or would you control the rate and then call a cardiology to come and see the patient? Would you attempt cardioversion with drugs, but not with shock? Or would you cardiovert with drugs or shock or whatever it took? Uh, and I'm sure there's quite a bit of variation in, in practice amongst our audience, which are uh, come from uh, diverse backgrounds in multiple parts of the world. Uh, the answer for Canada is D, cardiovert with drugs or shock, whatever it takes to work. So again, I'm going to uh, work on you a little bit and try to convince you that this is the best way to go. Uh, so why do I say rhythm control is better than rate control? It's better for the patient because the patient goes home quickly and in sinus rhythm and can return to normal activities very soon. There's no need for them to be prescribed rate control agents on discharge if they're in sinus rhythm. It's better for the hospital. Most hospitals uh, have a premium uh, of space and monitors and this way patients can leave the ED and be off monitors in less than six hours. It also avoids totally unnecessary admissions uh, to a monitored unit upstairs in the hospital. We published the RAF2 trial in the Lancet late last year, and this looked at two different ways of uh, managing acute atrial fibrillation in the ED. 
And uh, we found that both approaches, whether you give a drug followed by a shock or you just go straight to a shock, were highly effective, rapid, and safe. Uh, and in fact, 96% of all patients with acute atrial fibrillation were discharged home from the ED in sinus rhythm. And this study was conducted uh, in multiple Canadian hospitals and enrolled 400 or so patients. We found that the drug infusion, in this case, procainamide, worked for about 50% of patients, and for them, avoided resource-intensive procedural sedation. So our conclusion from this trial was that a medium, immediate ED rhythm control leads to excellent outcomes. Now, what do our cardiology colleagues tell us? So uh, the US, Canada, and Europe all have uh, very complex and detailed guidelines uh, written by uh, senior academic cardiologists. And unfortunately, they all have very little emergency department uh, input. And like sometimes is the case with senior cardiologists, they're a little paternalistic uh, telling us how to manage these patients. Uh, and I certainly kid our cardiologists in Ottawa because uh, they don't come down to see these patients. They might send a resident or a fellow, but uh, they don't uh, they don't come see them. In fact, I, I tell some of our EP physicians, cardiologists, I think you don't even know where the emergency is. So thanks for telling us how to manage these patients. So to address this gap, uh, we created a best practices checklist uh, three years ago. And this was from the Canadian Association of Emergency Physicians. And we had a gathered a panel of 20 uh, emergency physicians and cardiologists and adapted the Canadian Cardiovascular Society guidelines into a very practical uh, checklist, which is uh, specifically created for emergency uh, doctors. And uh, this guideline has been updated last month. So what I'm about to tell you uh, for the rest of this little talk is uh, pretty much the latest guidelines for emergency department care that you will find anywhere worldwide. In fact, there aren't that many guidelines <laughs> worldwide for emergency department. You certainly won't find emergency department management covered explicitly in any of those cardiology society guidelines I showed you before. So let's get back to rational management in the ED by the ED staff. Should you cardiovert? Is it safe? How to achieve good rate control? What do you, you can do about rhythm control, stroke prevention, and can your patient go home? Let's, let's dig in. So one of my colleagues uh, in uh, Canada uh, has created a rather uh, complicated infographic here. And we're not going to dwell on it because there's a lot of info on this page, but top left shows assessment and risk stratification. Bottom left talks about ideal rate or rhythm control procedures. Bottom right shows stroke prevention. And uh, top right talks about disposition and follow-up. So we're going to jump right into these four different uh, domains and, and get into details. In terms of initial assessment, the very first question you have to ask yourself, when you see a patient with a rapid rhythm and it's atrial fibrillation, is this a new onset arrhythmia or does this patient have chronic AF and they're really sick with something else? So you need to know if this is primary or secondary because the treatment is totally different. Even if they're unstable, you have to manage them completely differently. <clears throat> we'll get into that. And then third, is this patient safe for cardioversion? Have they been adequately anticoagulated for at least three weeks or how recently did it start? Did it start within 12 hours? Do they have CHADS comorbidity? Do you have access to transesophageal echo in your hospital? Probably not, but some sites do have it. So, a rapid rate can be secondary to medical causes. So these are patients with pre-existing permanent AF and problems can be, well be sepsis, bleeding, pulmonary embolism, heart failure, ACS. 
And the message here is to treat the underlying causes aggressively. Cardioversion may in fact be harmful and can cause a rapid deterioration because if the patient's been in AF for years, you can't possibly cardiovert them, it won't work. So sedation and all that is not gonna help their cause. You also might as well avoid rate control and focus on the underlying condition and give fluids or antibiotics or diuretics or whatever is indicated by uh, their underlying problem. All the other patients though have suddenly flipped into atrial fibrillation and they know the onset because they can tell. So a few tips to figure out if this is secondary uh, rapid AF in a patient with a, a permanent AF could be that you look at their previous ECGs, are they always in AF? Are there some consults or discharge summaries that suggest they're in AF? The patient may well know that they're in AF. Uh, they're on an anticoagulant, that's suggestive. And the secondary patients don't have sudden onset of palpitations. They just got sick gradually. Patients with primary arrhythmia, the palpitations start suddenly and they almost always know when that happens. Is the patient unstable? So we've talked about if it's secondary, you need to treat the underlying cause. Instability due to primary uh, AF is quite uncommon, except for a rapid ventricular pre-excitation or WPW. And we're talking about significantly unstable hypotension, ischemia, or pulmonary edema, in which case urgent electrical cardioversion is indicated. Uh, I might say that that's quite uncommonly required and uh, this differs from ACLS guidelines which uh, suggests you need to be wielding the, the uh, cardioversion paddles frequently. That is not the case. So let's talk in a little more detail about proper rate or rhythm control depending on uh, what it is that uh, is appropriate for this patient. So number one, is it safe to cardiovert this patient, okay? It's a bit complicated these days, but generally speaking, it's safe to cardiovert if the patient has been already anticoagulated for at least three weeks. So this might be the case of somebody with paroxysmal uh, atrial fib that comes back every once in a while, they're likely to already be on an anticoagulant, so it's safe. However, lots of patients aren't anticoagulated, so you need to know that it's safe to cardiovert them if there's no prior history of stroke or TIA, uh, no valvular heart disease, and they can fit in one of these categories. So everybody who shows up within 12 hours, it's safe to cardiovert, regardless of comorbidity. However, if they show up between 12 and 48 hours, you need to assure that they don't have multiple uh, CHADS criteria age 65, diabetes, hypertension, or heart failure. So if they have uh, more than one of these, it's not safe. Finally, if you're in a fairly high powered cardiac center, you might be able to get a transesophageal echo to clear their left, left atrium, and that allows you to go ahead and cardiovert somebody. So, uh, Although I'm a big fan of rhythm control, there are definitely times where uh, rate control uh, is, is what you have to do. And uh, so there's a few maxims here that I hope will be helpful to you. Um, either calcium channel or beta blockers are considered first line. They have to be given intravenously. Occasionally, even if you dose them properly, you're not having a uh, success in bringing the heart rate down, you might consider the opposite agent or IV digoxin as a role. Now, uh, either calcium channel blockers or beta blockers intravenously are fine. Doesn't matter, pick one. And then one of the issues that emergency doctors have is that they're too timid not in the dose, but in how frequently they give these agents. So typically, and, and we've given you the exact dose here, and you have to be very careful not to overdose them, but uh, ideally you would give up to three doses in the first hour. So I, for years, was extremely guilty of poor rate control. I would give 
the dilt, go see somebody else, come back in an hour, heart rate's up, then I'd give another dose. So you need to give it more frequently, not bigger doses, just more frequently. And after you got the three doses in, if the rate's slowing down, give an oral dose too, so it will uh, persist, all right? Now, uh, DIG is second line because it's slower, but it's still an extremely effective drug. Uh, and you, uh, the correct dosing and intervals is well established. Uh, so if the other calcium or beta blockers don't work, DIG uh, may be your solution. If the patient shows up and they're already hypotensive or in acute heart failure, then DIG is the way to go. You don't want to be using beta blockers or calcium channel blockers if patients in acute heart failure or hypotension. Now, you're looking after this patient and whether you're going to send them home or refer them for admission, it's your job to get the heart rate down. There's no need, no need to do an incomplete job of this. And your goal is to get the heart rate below 100. And you can do that within the first hour or so. If you're going to send them home, uh, maybe get them up walking and uh, make sure the heart rate stays under 110. Now, this is my favorite part, which is good rhythm control uh, for patients. Um, so we believe that whether you use ph uh, pharmacological cardioversion, electrical cardioversion, either one's acceptable, but it's important to discuss it with the patient because the patient may well have a preference. And as you know, some of these folks come back every six months or a year and they have preferences like Procainamide always works, so let's go with it. Or the procainamide never works, so it just shocked me, Doc. Uh, we have lots of patients like that. They know what they want, okay? Uh, now, in Canada, we recommend procainamide IV uh, given over 60 minutes. This drug uh, has been around for a long time, and probably every hospital in the world has it because it's also useful for uh, other things such as uh, ventricular arrhythmias, but doesn't get much airtime. It's often not well known because it's been around so long and it's extremely cheap. <laughs> so uh, we'll talk about alternatives depending on where you uh, live and work. Uh, amiodarone IV is absolutely not recommended if you want a cardioverted patient in the ED. Uh, you'll see it used all the time in ICU and post-op areas, but those are different patients. They have significant cardiac uh, morbidity. Our patients don't have significant cardiac morbidity and the amiodarone is poor. It is, doesn't convert most patients and it's very slow. It takes forever to get an infusion going. So we strongly recommend you do not use IV amiodarone. That might be a surprise. Other options, depending on where you live, could be IV vernaculant, IV ibutilide, IV propafenone, and IV flecainide. In Canada, we only have procainamide, vernaculant, and ibutilide. And I think in the US, you don't even have vernaculant. So your, your choices are more limited to procainamide or ibutilide. Ibutilide has a risk of percent the point, so we're not really with that particular age. Electrical cardioversion. Uh, it's just a few tips here to make it more uh, successful. It's pretty easy to do. So if you're not used to doing electrical cardioversion, uh, but you do uh, reduction of dislocated shoulders under sedation, then you're going to like cardioversion because it's easier. Okay. Now, uh, typically you'll wanna have two nurses or a nurse and a respiratory therapist. Be nice if you have a second doctor, if your hospital is big enough, but you don't need even a second doctor, okay? Uh, you obviously wanna sedate the patient according to whatever uh, local practice is. In Canada, we almost always use propofol and we give the propofol ourselves, the emergency doctor. So you don't need an anesthetist and you sure as heck don't need a cardiologist to do this. And I mean, where you work, if you dislocate, if you reduce a shoulder and you need anesthesia and orthopedics, well then 
what fun is emergency medicine? So these are core procedures, in our opinion. Pad and paddle position. Our RAF2 trial demonstrated clearly that either anterolateral or anterior posterior positions are acceptable. They're both equally effective. Okay. Uh, we highly recommend you start high with 150 to 200 joules synchronized. Don't start low as perhaps some guidelines you've seen in the past. Nobody recommends starting low. Uh, start at least 150 or 200 joules. Now, there's a few tips. If you're having trouble getting the patient back in sinus rhythm, you could try the opposite uh, pad position. You can take paddles and press down on the pads. The pads provide the shock, but the paddles provide the pressure, which sometimes increases efficacy. If all that doesn't work, go back to square one. And if you haven't given a drug like uh, procainamide, give it now, run it in. And even if it doesn't cardiovert, your electrical cardioversion is almost certain to work. We give propofol, patients wake up, they want to go home and we're quite comfortable uh, to send them home within 30 minutes after electrical cardioversion or uh, pharmacological cardioversion. This condition that everybody working in an emergency department needs to know about, that's rapid ventricular pre-excitation or WPW. Uh, if the patient's unstable, just shock them. However, Many of these patients are actually young and are surprisingly stable sitting up talking to you and it's quite as appropriate to use IV procainamide or ibutylide in that case. It's a whole bunch of drugs that uh, are not safe. So any AV nodal blocking agent like digoxin, calcium channel blockers, beta blockers or adenosine are absolutely contraindicated. They could make the patient uh, rapidly deteriorate uh, or around, and that is not good. Okay, let's move on now to ensure that uh, patients who present with acute atrial fibrillation are protected in the future from a stroke. And it doesn't matter how you manage them, whether it's rate of rhythm control, shock them, or giving them procainamide, you have to consider uh, the importance of preventing a, a stroke down the road. So remember, we want you to prescribe oral anticoagulants to prevent stroke in the long run, okay? So the very simple rule, if they're CHADS positive, any of the five classic criteria, stroke, age 65, diabetes, hypertension, heart failure, we want you to prescribe uh, an OIC before the patient leaves. Uh, we don't subscribe to CHADS VASC, CHADS 2, CHAD 65, because they all vary slightly and uh, can get confusing. But if the patient has any one of those, then it's high recommended that you start uh, an agent. Uh, it's important then to discuss this carefully with the patient so they understand what they're uh, getting into. Uh, patients with coronary disease, uh, you can stop their ASA unless they're already on another antiplatelet, in which case things are getting complicated. You might need to talk to a cardiologist. Now, some societies want you to put the patient on OAC for four weeks, even if they have no CHADS criteria. Uh, in Canada, this is a weak recommendation based on low quality evidence. And for sure, if you wish to bring that up, you should discuss it with your patient because our experience is young patients uh, who are active, doing stuff, sports, are not at all keen to be on OAC for four weeks. Important point is patients who come in with atrial fib, but they convert prior to you actually treating them. They also need to be considered for uh, OAC depending on their CHADS uh, criteria status. Of course, uh, you have to consider bleeding risk. And there's no practical uh, risk scale that uh, we're familiar with. Uh, so our colleagues at McMaster University have developed uh, a checklist of uh, contraindications. Uh, 
to doing uh, prescribing any anticoagulant. So this is something uh, I would recommend you have a look at. Okay, patient needs an anticoagulant, which one? Well, DOAX are preferred by a long shot because um, they are uh, very quick onset and they don't need ongoing monitoring like warfarin. However, monitor, uh, warfarin is indeed uh, recommended if the patient has a mechanical valve, has moderate to severe uh, mitral stenosis, or has uh, renal insufficiency with uh, a low creatinine clearance. Emergency doctors don't prescribe DOAX very often, so we recommend you just pick one of the four that's available in North America. They're all effective, just pick one, get to know it, but look it up. You know, in Canada, we have the Thrombosis Canada app, but there's lots of good references on. You won't we'll be using it all that often. So, can you send the patient home? Remember I said in the RAF2 trial, 96% of patients went home uh, from uh, the ED in sinus rhythm. So, Occasionally, you'll need to admit a patient because they have uh, a STEMI, a non-STEMI. Their heart failure is not getting better, or they're still, you can't control the heart rate, and they're still symptomatic. So this leads me to a point about ACS. Please do not order troponin on these patients because it'll always be slightly elevated due to demand, and that's meaningless. However, you may feel then the requirement to repeat it three hours, six hours. So don't do it. It's not necessary. Unless the patient has an elephant on their chest or has uh, very worrisome ECG changes. Okay. So again, patients rarely require hospital admission unless they're asymptomatic, highly symptomatic. I mean, ACS, acute heart failure. Most patients don't need to see a doctor for a month or so unless you have started warfarin, which requires monitoring, or you have needed to put them on oral rate control agents. Uh, depending on your local practice, uh, they should be seen by cardiology or internal medicine within four to six weeks. We recommend you give the patient a handout because being a, a new atrial fib patient, uh, has all kinds of implications for their health in the future, and they're not gonna remember everything that you tell them. Uh, it's not our role to prescribe uh, antiarrhythmics uh, in the ED, that's for cardiologists. Most antiarrhythmics, oral ones don't work, and the one that does, amiodarone, orally is, uh, can be quite toxic. And there's no need to prescribe rate control agents if you've uh, achieved uh, sinus rhythm. So, but to wrap up, let's look at my bottom lines here for acute atrial fibrillation and flutter. Uh, number one, rule out secondary causes of a rapid AF. Remember, it's rare to be unstable if the patient actually has a, a acute onset AF. Please cardiovert if it's safe to do so. If you must use rate control, give a proper loading dose uh, and try to get three doses in the first hour. Strongly urge you to try IV pharmacological cardioversion with procainamide or whatever you have in your hospital. Start at 150 to 200 joules. Almost all patients can be sent home. And prescribe a DOAC if they have any of the CHADS criteria, age 65, heart failure, hypertension, diabetes, or stroke. And here's my bottom, bottom line, which is Almost all acute AF patients can be cardioverted in the emergency department and sent home quickly in sinus rhythm. Thank you so much for your attention. And I'd be happy to answer a few questions. Thank you, Dr. Steele. Um, great overview of AFib. We did have a couple of questions come in. One was from the Netherlands. There are some cardiac literature out there that says that patients can be bad about actually knowing the onset of their symptoms and can be an AFib, A flutter for a while. What do you think about the finding about that they're being able to tell what their actual on, time of onset is? Uh, so we have considerable experience with this, thousands of patients. And 
the, the patient can tell almost always. They're sitting at home watching TV and suddenly their heart takes off and is pounding away at 150 plus. Uh, they feel the palpitations. So almost always the patient knows. There's no doubt about it. Or they went to bed fine and then they wake up in the middle of the night or in the morning and uh, they've got palpitations. There is an exception, uh, like everything else in medicine, and that's the elderly patient who, uh, the very elderly patient who may not even be aware that their heart's going fast. They just feel weak and they've been, you know, moping around the house for a while, for a number of days, feeling weak. They go to the hospital and lo and behold, the triage nurse finds their heart rate's 150. So they had no sudden onset of palpitations and therefore you can assume that it's highly likely that the onset was more than 12 or 48 hours prior. But that's a, a small minority of cases. Awesome. You mentioned a whole bunch of drugs that I don't think some of our younger physicians are familiar <laughs> with. Um, it seems like amiodarone is the go-to drug for any arrhythmia. If the heart skips a beat, amiodarone seems to be everybody's first line agent. But can you um, restress your thoughts on procainamide and digoxin, two drugs that I think a lot of people have never prescribed? Sure. Okay, well, amiodarone is uh, really uh, not helpful in the emergency department. So try to get over that if you can. Uh, procainamide has been around for over 60 years. It's highly effective. Uh, and your hospital almost certainly has it. Uh, it's easy to use, run it in over an hour, and we, it has very few adverse events other than the risk of uh, transient hypotension. But uh, I, I published lots of stuff on it, and the incidence of arrhythmias, for example, is extremely low. It's a very safe drug. Uh, and digoxin, now, as I said, uh, I've said before, I've been using it for at least 100 years <laughs> because uh, it, it's an old drug. And it is useful. It's not first line, but again, if uh, your patient uh, has a bit of hypotension or heart failure, that might be the safer route to go. And it's not the only reason it's not first line is because uh, it's a, it's slow and onset. But it is quite a quite a useful little drug to have in your in your bag. And uh, again, uh, surely. Young doctors at least are taught about it, but maybe they're not encouraged to use it, but it, it for sure has a role. So if you had any um, a pharmacy with that endless limits and drugs on formulary, what would be your go-to drug for atrial fib, your first line treatment for rate control or cardio conversion? Well, for a rate control, it's pretty straightforward. It's diltiazem or mertoprolol. Uh, no need to get fancy. Uh, everybody has those. For rhythm control, I have a, ma a vast experience with procainamide, so I like that, you know. But Europeans, for example, they have other stuff, uh, flecainide and propafenol, available in intravenous that we don't have access to. So I, I mentioned, I think, um, five or six drugs that, depending on where you live, are available in the IV form, uh, including vernaclant, it's widely used in Europe, uh, butylide is out there. We're not keen on it. Uh, so just pick one, <laughs> whatever you got your hands on locally, depending where you live. <laughs> and I'm just curious, do you think Canada and the U.S. will ever get flecainide or propanol, propanol for this use? I, I have no idea. I, I know like the FDA is pretty sticky and they won't even approve vernacolant, even though it's been approved in Europe for 10 years and we've had it in Canada for three or four years. So I, I really not sure, you know, if you understand how the FDA works, uh, maybe you could share that with me. <laughs> I'd have a different career. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for joining us again today to um, talk about atrial fibrillation and good rate control. I definitely love the fact that you brought up some drugs that aren't commonly used, but probably should be used more commonly. We actually had one point at our hospital there, they were planning to take procainamide off the formulary because um, they had only asked the cardiologists and the cardiologists were, don't use it that often. But I think for us in the emergency department, it's a really, really good drug. Uh, 
um, a lot safer than some of the other ones that. Are, yeah, our car, are our EP cardiologists use it all the time in their EP lab, uh, and they're really super aggressive with it. So maybe your cardiologist like I do light, I'm guessing, but you know we're not so fond of it because of the two sides of the pond. But <laughs> I'm glad you were able to hang on to the procainamide. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you again, sir. Um, we'll have some questions and answers at the end of the morning, um, where we'll probably hear from you again. Uh, but thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for joining in. Bye-bye.